Okay, so how's everybody doing? Um, anybody started the most recent assignment yet? Yes. Um, technical difficulties, anyone? Yes, so what's the difficulty? Uh, yeah, so you may get uh, you may get the results in a in a different order. That's okay. Um, if you get as long as you get the same set of results. Um, if you want to make it really nice, uh, you could look up, for example, um, arrays dot sort uh, or s the sort method for arrays, and uh, then you can sort things into alphabetical order or, or whatever you want. But the assignment doesn't ask for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other difficulties? Unzipping the file, anyone? Yeah, so a few people uh, tried to follow my directions literally and, uh, and used unzip to unzip the file at the command line. That doesn't work under Windows. Uh, it probably works under Mac OS. Can anyone confirm that? Yes. Um, so under Windows it doesn't. So under Windows, just go and browse to the file with your file browser, double click it, and, uh, and that'll open it on, uh, on recent versions of Windows anyway. Um, okay, so one, uh, just one thing I, I want to just quickly do, and it has to do with the assignment, is, uh, is take a look at it. So when you unzip the file, this is what you get. Two directories, one is called mp3s, another one is called mutagen. Mutagen is the library, the Python library that we're using for uh, reading mp3 files. MP3s is about 5,000 MP3 files. Uh, no, it's not my music collection. Well, it is my music collection, but all the files have been truncated. So the only thing that's left of them is the headers that contain the, the information and maybe a fraction of a second of, uh, of sound you could play from it. But uh, I'm not distributing, uh, uh, you know, 5,000 songs uh, to you guys. Uh, and then there's this one file, this test file which is just to show you how, how you can do something, in particular the main thing you want to do with the mutagen library. <coughs> so, um, you know, part four of the assignment, after you've built classes that describe uh, tracks, uh, classes that describe albums, and classes, I think it's tracks and albums, um, then sort of the last part of the assignment is to go through all of these mp3 files, load them up, and, uh, and then you know, be able to, to search uh, on the content of these things. And that's where we need this external library. We don't want to learn the exact format of mp3 files to, to do it ourselves. So we borrow this library. Um, and this little snippet of code here, you don't have to really totally understand what it does but, or how it works, but all it does is <clears throat> you give it a directory name, that's this line right here, yep, yes. Um, so you give it a directory name, that's what's in the quotes here, dot means the current directory, and it'll walk through the entire directory, um, getting, uh, listing out all the files, all the subdirectories, and, uh, and everything else, and what you look for are the files, so you iterate through all the files in those subdirectories, and any one that ends with .mp3, that's what you, uh, you open. Okay. So this, this then makes a file name, and the mutagen stuff happens in here. So we open an mp3 file, so let's just do that. Um, so Let's say we import all this stuff and we open. So in the mp3s directory, I think there's a file called one.mp3. So 
So when we open it, we get this funny looking thing. Um, this thing is actually called a dictionary, and we'll be learning about those shortly. But um, for what we need for this assignment is to just know that when you open one of these files, you get this thing that has a bunch of attributes. And <coughs> you, can, uh, you can try and figure out what these attributes mean. The assignment tells you. So one is TDRC, um, and if you look at the, the value of that, uh, it looks like it's 1993. Another one is TIT2, and the value of that is Biohazard and Onyx Judgment Night. Another one is TRCK, the value of that is the string 4. So how do you access these things? Well, um, so the, 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 the things that you're interested in, they're listed in the assignment, but for example, um, one of them is this TIT2. And if you look at that, you get close to what you want. It's somehow, this looks like the, uh, the title of the song or some kind of title. And although it's in this weird looking format. So anybody know what this format is all about? It's the cause of a lot of grief on the, on the internet, a lot of problem software. So this is in Unicode. Um, so Unicode is this code for encoding strings that uh, for every possible language known to man and some that uh, are not even languages. We don't want to have to deal with Unicode and so when we look, when we get these things, we'll just convert them to strings. Okay. So if I open an audio track and I want to get its title, this is what I do. String audio at uh, TIT2. Um, if I want to know which album it comes from, I do the same thing for TL. Okay. So the first three parts of the assignment <coughs> basically set up the objects that represent albums and tracks. Um, and then the, uh, and maybe some other stuff, I don't remember. Um, and then, and as well as a little thing that if you give it some albums and tracks allows you to do searching and then the final part is for you to, to go through use this this mp3 library to pull all this information out of these 5,000 mp3 files and load up this this program that you've made now with all this information so you can do searches in it or you can you don't have to use these mp3 files you can use your own mp3 files whatever you whatever you want to do um, and so basically you're going to go through this thing and add all of these, you know, define all these tracks based on, uh, on the information you find, you find in here. Okay? So this will become hopefully, you know, more clear as you start the assignment. Um, the first two questions are fairly easy to, to start, um, easy to do, and then you have to do a little bit of testing by hand. Uh, the next, the third question is ask you to make an application that does all these different kinds of searches. It's hard to test that without having some data, so maybe you want to do the fourth question first. Uh, it's up to you, but, uh, but there, you, there you go. Okay, so does anybody have questions about this right now? Okay. So what I recommend is that you start on this as soon as possible. So this is somehow the, probably the, the most perilous assignment you've had so far. Um, the first two were pretty much cookie cutter, uh, write a function that does this, write a function that does that. The third one was make a game of your own design, um, but there you have the advantage that you can make the game as simple as you want. Here you're actually given a fairly precise specification of a program that you need to write that reads data from files in a, in a particular format. It has to have all this functionality and basically you have to start this from scratch. Um, so it's easy to get caught up on small things. Start now while you still have TAs to, available to, uh, to help you out with it, okay? So there's all these TAs in the, in the tutorial room. 
Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I think we have one TA for this course who has office hours on Friday. So lots of, uh, lots of help, but if you wait until Friday night or Saturday to start this, well, you're, you'll still be able to get help, but only through the forums and mostly just from other students. Okay. So get started on this as, uh, as soon as possible. Okay, um, <clears throat> so last class we started looking at uh, objects and we had defined this, uh, this little class. So last class for us was September 30th. Uh, no, yes. So we define this, this object um, or this class of objects called a person and we saw that well when you want to define a new class of objects you create an init function that initializes the, uh, the values uh, in this object. So our init function took these two arguments first name and last name uh, and then stored them in self.firstName and self.lastName. We also saw that if you define this function underscore underscore string, then when you print an object that has this function defined, it will print it in a nice way. It will, uh, it will use underscore underscore string to convert that thing to a string and it'll print that, that string. And then we saw that you can do, uh, I mean, you can write functions that do anything. So for example, uh, if you want to change the person's last name, you can uh, you can uh, just do uh, just do something. Uh, write a function like this that sets uh, self's last name to whatever the the new argument is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so. And you create a new instance of this object uh, by just calling the class name as if it's a function. And what that really does is calls init uh, and with this, this newly created thing that inside init it's, it's referred to as self. Okay. So me, and now if I look at me.firstName, it's Pat. If I look at me.lastName, it's Morin. If I print me, I get, uh, I get the result of this function, which pens the first name and last name. And if I change the last name to, let's say, Moran, then indeed that, uh, that changes the last name. OK. So questions about that so far? No, that's all fairly straightforward. So you can think of basically one of these persons as just a blob that has some data associated with it. The data is the first name and the last name, and it also has some functions, uh, or what they're called, we call them methods associated with it that you can call on it. So for example, change last name is a method. Um, underscore, underscore, string is a method. So there, we can, we can call these things. Um, and really, the, the other thing that we saw is this notation where I say me dot change last name uh, like this, that's just a, a fancy way of doing this. So it's just a fancy way of calling this method inside person, the person class that's called change last name and making its first argument be me. Okay. So it has the, the same effect. 
<coughs> it's just this is somehow a nicer way to, uh, to write it. And um, it's, a, it's a way of writing it that uh, somehow reads nicely. Like I say, you know, let, let, let's say instead, uh, So you can sort of read this, and, and when you're making method names, um, think of, of verbs. So here I'm saying, Pat, change your last name, or Pat, you know, change, change last name, or Pat, whatever. Uh, Pat, turn yourself into a string. Um, OK, so now, so let's fix. Okay, so now I've created two person objects. Uh, one is assigned to the variable me, and the other one is assigned to the variable pat. Um, so we learned about identity versus equality last time, and uh, we asked this question. Are these two people identical? Yes? So who thinks the answer is yes? And who thinks the answer is false? Okay. So the false group is right um, because while well, we've, we've seen these box pictures, if we look at how we created these, uh, these two persons, We have a box for me, and we have a box for Pat. And to get me, we said something like me equals person Pat Morin. And so that creates this new person with first name. is Pat, and last name is Morin, and me is then just a, a reference to that person. So this is who me refers to us at this point. So objects are not primitive data types. You can't fit them inside these boxes. All you can fit inside these boxes are a reference to the, the object. And so later when we create uh, Pat is a, new, is a person named Pat Morin. Basically, we create a whole new one of these things. And Pat then refers to this other one. And of course, we can test that. How do we test that? Yep. Uh, not equal to, that won't necessarily tell us much. In fact, that'll be somewhat surprising. But how do we test that, that me and Pat are actually two different things? Yeah? Uh, change yeah. So, uh, right, so we have me, we have Pat. Let's uh, say change last name uh, to Dynamite. So if I print me, it's Pat Dynamite, but if I print Pat, it's still Pat Mora. If those were the same object, then changing one would have changed the other one as well, right? Because they'd be the, the same thing. Or changing one would, would change that one that they both refer to. So those are two different things. So let's set this, this name back. Okay. So there's me and there's Pat again, and we've, uh, we've convinced ourselves that this is the picture of these things. Me refers to one person and Pat refers to another person. They just happen to have the same first name and the same last name. Um, what about this? 
Are these two persons equal? So who thinks they're equal? Yeah. Who thinks they're not equal? Okay. So so why do you think they're equal? Yep. Okay. So if we go by analogy with arrays, if we have two arrays that contain that are the same length and they contain the same values at the same locations, then those two arrays they're defined as equal, right? We've checked that. We've created two different arrays before and then tested if they were equal, um, and, and indeed they were, even though they weren't identical. So the natural thing for two persons to be equal would be, well, if the two persons have the same first name and they have the same last name, then they should be equal, right? Those are the two attributes of persons, um, and if they're all equal, then that seems like they should be equal. Um, but Indeed, it's false. What's that? Yeah. So um, somehow these these for some reason these things are not treated as equal. And to understand why, we need to to look at the sort of default behavior for for objects. So. I haven't defined much in this, uh, this class, right? Just a way to create it, a way to turn it into a string, and a way to, uh, to change the last name. So any other behavior that this thing has is somehow a default behavior that's, that's inherited from any other, from all objects, so that all objects behave this way. And it turns out that in an object, <coughs> so that's the right person, is a kind of object, and it turns out that objects define what it means to be equal, but they just use a silly definition that is two things are equal if and only if they're identical. So here, um, equality and identity mean the same thing for persons. Either they're exactly the same object or they're, um, or they're, they're different. Now that's not natural for us, so we would like it maybe for whatever application we're doing that if two people have the same first name and they have the same last name maybe they should be treated equal and for that we just define another one of these special methods underscore underscore eq underscore underscore um, it takes one argument uh, besides itself and that's the thing that you want to know if it's equal to. And so when are two people, when do we like to say two people are equal? Yeah. So if they have the same first name and the same last name. So self.firstname equals self.other.firstname. And self dot last name equals other dot last name. Okay. So let's test that out. distinct persons, but if I ask you equals me, the answer is true. And that's just because <clears throat> this equals operator, all it does is call this method here. Okay. If this method is not defined, it calls some default version of that method, which is provided for all objects, but the default version just, just returns whether or not the two things are identical. Um, so very often you want to uh, redefine what it means for two objects to be, uh, to be equal. Um, 
and that's, that's how you do it. Okay. So, okay, so there's, uh, there's some, uh, there's a sort of brief introduction to, to objects, and somehow I keep pulling things out of thin air. All these things with underscore, underscore around them, I just seem to know these. So how do I know these? Well, because I had to learn them at some point. Uh, and so you can look them up online. Uh, so Python object protocols, I think maybe what we want to search for. There we go. So there's a whole bunch of these special things. Um, so things like new and init and del. Um, so del, for example, when the object disappears, you, you can, it calls del. Um, representation, this is something that you can define so that the object prints itself in some useful way, uh, slightly different than string. If you want objects which are allowed to be compared to each other, not only for equality, but uh, so that you can compare them with less than, less than or equal to, equal to, not equal to, greater than, and, and so on, um, you define these methods. And so there's a whole bunch of these built-in things, and pretty much everything that you do uh, in Python, so every operator has some object uh, version of it. So, for example, um, where would I find it? Maybe I can just look for plus. There we go. Um, if you want to have objects that you can add together, for example, you define this underscore underscore add method. So for example, it doesn't really make sense for people, but uh, we can say So I don't know, what should we do when we add two persons together? What should the result be? Who knows, right? Maybe it's a, a list of two persons, or maybe we concatenate their names. Whatever makes sense for, for your application. So I don't know, let's do something silly. Uh, so we'll create a new person who's... Uh, whose name is obtained by adding together the two names of the the individual people, okay? Uh, probably doesn't make sense for any application, but it's something we, we can do. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> so whatever you want, however you want to define it. So if you want to do something like, you know, implement your own special kind of numbers, uh, I don't know, uh, irrational numbers or however you want, all you need to do is define those methods and uh, so add 
uh, there'll be add, subtract, all of those ones listed in that, uh, that document. And, uh, and then you can just write, you know, mathematical equations using those, those, uh, those numbers that you've just defined. Okay. Um, so maybe to get us sort of started in the, the right direction, uh, we should see how, how these objects are useful in, in programming. So they're, they're really just a modeling device. So I already told you more or less after the fourth class we had, so after two weeks, that we, had a, we already knew enough of the programming language that we could compute anything that's computable. And so objects, they're just a little bit of icing on the cake that help us write programs. Um, they don't make the language any more powerful, but they make it maybe a little bit easier for people to understand if we use objects properly. And one thing that really calls out for that is uh, we created a game a few classes back. It was a quiz game. And so let's open that. So remember this quiz game we created a, a while back? Uh, it opens a, a CSV file. In that file, there's a whole bunch of questions. And we, uh, we then, you know, play this game where we pick a question at random and the person has to answer it. And there were some rules. So here's the, the main loop from our quiz game. It, uh, it has some scores, level, and lives. I, I forget the exact rules. But it basically asks these, these questions. So, if, so is there anything in this game that is a little bit uh, let's say, not represented well or difficult to understand for someone who comes along and, and reads this code. Something that we could use an object to represent rather than what we're doing. So what, what is in this game? What are the elements in this game? So there's questions. There's score. Level, lives, so a bunch of stuff like that. Um, so what's the most obvious candidate for an object? Yep. Question. question. If we look at what a question was in this game, uh, want the game to end. Uh, let's see if I can just kill it. Okay. Um, so we saw we could say Questions is load questions and the file name was quiz.csv. So questions was a list of 646 questions. And if we looked at one of those questions, it's just a list or an array uh, itself. Now, <coughs> This isn't a, uh, a great representation, right? This isn't very intuitive. In fact, this representation just came because that's the way things were listed in this file we're, we're using. If someone else comes along and, uh, and wants to, to play this, anybody know the answer? Two ways to know the answer to this. You can either have played the game or you can Super Mario. 
uh, the first, in, remember in the file, the first question, the first answer is always the, the right answer. But uh, it's not really intuitive to say, oh, you know, um, this is fine, to say that, you know, pick a question from a list of questions. But then, if I want to know what the actual question is, I have to say Q at zero. If I want to know what the answers, possible answers are, those are Q at one, Q at two, Q at three. Then there's this Q at, uh, at five thing, which was not even clear, uh, not obvious at all what that is. And then this Q at six, which is even less obvious what that is. So this is not a really intuitive representation. Somebody who uh, comes along later and tries to read our code will just be scratching their head wondering, okay, let's look at print question here. Oh, well, we print Q at zero, and then we iterate for the range I, one, two, three, four, and then we, we print I and Q at this. It just looks like, um, it just looks like a, a real pain, right? This doesn't, this isn't easy to read. Um, if we go back in here, there's some magic numbers. Uh, if P answer is, is equal to one, why one? What, why is one the right answer? Um, not at all obvious, okay? So, um, maybe the, the most obvious thing is to model a question as an object. Okay. So we'll create a new class of objects called question. So when we create a new class of objects, what's sort of the first thing we have to do? So what's the first method we have to write? Init. So we want to create an init method. And it's going to have some arguments. Let's figure out what those, those arguments are. Um, all right. So what, what parts does a question have? It has what? Oh, not a file name. So the file name is actually just a a list, of, I mean, the, the file name is, is uh, apart from that. We're going to read individual questions from that file. But for one of these questions, like this one, Q, here, what are the, the parts of it? Yeah. So there's the question itself. So probably we want to set that. When we create the question, we want to say what, what it is. So... Um, so maybe we should take an argument called question. What else? The options. So the answers or options. Uh, I don't know, let's call them answers. What else? Yeah. The, the group, the category? Yeah. And let's use short names up here so we don't. Good catch. And anything else? What's that? The level, the difficulty. Uh, or maybe we should use the same term because we're already using level. So let's say level. Okay. okay. Good. Um, so now we've defined a, uh, a question. Uh, what else? So maybe we should keep track of what the correct answer. And you know, at this point, the correct answer is one. It's the, or actually, 
in the in the list of options, it's going to be uh, it's going to be zero. So let's try and uh, and make one of these things. So I'll disable the game for now because I don't want it to run every time we load this file. So I want to create a new question and uh, so this is how we do it. We call the class name as if it's a uh, as if it's the name of a function. And let's say we want to make this question. So what are the arguments we pass in? Q. Well, Q is a whole array. So do we want to give it just a whole array? What's that? Uh, well, Q is just this thing here. So if we give it Q, um, then then basically we're passing an array as an argument. So this thing needs one, two, three, four arguments. We're only giving it one. Yep? Do you want to split up into the values of the array that uh, are associated with what you want? Yeah. So the first thing we're supposed to provide is the text of the question. Where is that in Q? That's Q at zero. Now the next thing we're supposed to provide is a list of possible options. So what's that? Yep. Q at 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is Q sliced from 1 up to, to 5. Next, we're supposed to provide the category. That's Q at 6. And then finally, uh, the level, which is Q at 7. Zero. Ah, five here and six here. <coughs> so there's the question we just created. Hmm. Not very insightful, uh, but we can inspect it. We can ask what is the what is the actual text of the question? Good. That looks correct. What are the options? There's four options. What's the category? And what level of difficulty is it? It's a two. And what's the correct answer? The correct answer is the option zero in this, uh, this list here. OK. okay. Um, so it looks like we've, we've succeeded so far. What else should our, could our questions do? I mean, we're, we're already defining this question thing, so this, we can already use this to make our, our code easier. So let's say we want to use this. Um, so when we load the questions, rather than create a, an array of arrays, we would like to create an array of questions. So here we are. Um, what we had done before was create this, this array of arrays. We took a line and we split it. Uh, we took each line and, and split it. That gave us these seven parts. Um, now, rather than, than split it, we'd like to do something different. So maybe we can say def, uh, so we've already 
written the code for this. Uh, let's call that Q. So if we have one of these arrays that we got out of the file, well, this is how we can turn it into a question, right? We, uh, we just do that. Split the line and we say question from array. So let's see if that works. So again, we get 646 questions, but now they are questions, right? If we look at question at zero, it's a question object now. It's no longer an array. And if I look at questions at zero, what's the text of the question? There it is. What, is the, what are the options? Uh, so those are called. There they are. And so on. Okay, so now we got to the stage where <clears throat> rather than load an array of arrays, we loaded an array of questions. Let's try and push that through the rest of the, uh, and I would just like to touch this up to make it a little bit clearer. That what we're taking as an argument is an array and we're returning actual question. Um, okay, let's touch up this function, the function that prints a question. So it takes Q uh, and prints it. So here, this used to print Q at zero, what should it print now? So this Q used to be an array, now it's a question, and Q at zero used to be the text of the question, now that's called Q.question. Okay. And let's, uh, let's go back to the dumb version of the game that doesn't do any, uh, any permuting. So now it's printed the, the text of the question, what it wants to print now is the, the possible options. And what are the possible options? Where do we get those from? So q.options at i. And remember, q.options now is an array with four options, indexed by 0, 1, 2, and 3. So we want that for all i in the range 4. Um, so 0, 1, 2, and 3. And we still like to present this version to the user. Okay. We'll quickly test that. Question, questions at zero. There we go. So it nicely prints the, the question in the, in the same way as before, in a way that's, uh, that's readable. But now, if a programmer comes and looks at this code, this is much less magical than it was before, right? 
This used to be code that said, you know, print Q at zero. Well, what's that? I don't know. Uh, and then print Q at one, Q at two, Q at three, Q at four. What are those things? I don't know. Well, now it's, it's a little bit more clear. This is a bit more readable. We first print the question, and then we print four options for that question. Okay, let's see if we can push this through to our, uh, the rest of our game. So this doesn't deal with questions at all, read answer. But there is our, our quiz game here. <coughs> and so what does the quiz game do? Uh, it sleeps, it loads the questions. We've, we don't have to change anything there. It picks a random question. And uh, this, this makes sure we, we pick a question at the right level. So what do we need to change here? Yeah. So Q at 6 is now Q at level, Q dot level. So uh, as long as Q's level is not, uh, is not correct, then we, we keep trying. In fact, maybe we can simplify our lives a little bit here because if we look at, uh, if we look at our, our question constructor, um, it takes the level as an argument. Maybe we should just, uh, just take this as, a, as an integer. So maybe we should take, specify that this should be uh, an integer. So maybe when we're making a question, we should already specify that as an integer. Then we won't make the mistake later of comparing a string and an integer. And that is down here. So now as, Q, as long as Q's level is not this level, then this is for permuting the answer. Let's, uh, let's dodge that for a while because our print question function doesn't take that argument anymore even. Then we print the question. We already, we already did that. And then we want to check if the answer is correct. So. The user inputs some number, a and s, and we'd like to know if a and s corresponds to the correct answer for this question. So how do we do that? So the user enters an integer between 1 and 4, and what's the correct answer for this question? Yeah. Uh, well, it is Q dot options at zero, but eventually maybe it won't be. And do we have another way of, of, so the zeroth answer is correct, which means if the user picks one, that's the, the correct answer, uh, because they pick one through four and the actual questions are zero through, or the answers are, are zero through three. But, uh, but what should we compare their answer to? Yeah. So, what we want is that if answer minus 1, that takes us from the range 1 through 4 down to 0 through 3, if that's equal to Q dot correct, was it option? Answer. Correct answer. Maybe I should change that to correct option. If we're going to call the answers options, maybe we should we should call this the correct option. Okay. And then we check if the user picks the, uh, the correct option. Is that, uh, is that correct or incorrect? And we, we play the game that way. Okay. Let's see if we got that working. Okay, what's the correct answer? Not a trick question. 
One, correct. One, correct. One, correct. Two, error. So, <clears throat> says, question object does not support indexing on line 61. We look at line 61, we said, incorrect. The answer was, oops, and then we said Q at 1. But Q is not an array anymore, now it's a question. So how do we get the correct answer? Like this? Is that right? No. Why not? Yeah, so correct option is an integer, right? It's, right now, it's, we know it's zero. But, uh, but what we really want is the string. We want the text of the answer. So that's q.options at the correct option. Uh, not a, q. Correct, wrong, correct answer was Stefan. Wrong, 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 and the game is over. <clears throat> okay, um, so all that seems to be working. Now the game is boring again because the correct answer is always the first option. So. We would like to fix that. Now, notice a few things got simplified. Uh, because if you look at our game now, basically a question has everything that it needs in it. We didn't have to, we didn't do this uh, permuting of the answers. So both the, the method for printing uh, the question was simpler. And this logic of creating a random permutation and then checking to see if the answer at the permutation is equal to the correct, is equal to one, um, we, that, we didn't do that here. And there's no reason we should do that here. Since we're making a question class anyway, and a question can do whatever it wants when it loads itself, um, maybe the, the best thing is than for it to randomize the answers itself. Okay. So, uh, so how do we do that? Okay. So maybe we'll shuffle the options. Now, before we shuffle up the options, what should we do? We should store the correct answer. So, um, so that's option at zero, right? And then we can say random dot shuffle self dot options. And now, this self.correct option is no longer zero anymore. Yep. Yes, yes. So the, the correct option is, well, so what do we have? We've stored the correct option. It's called correct here. And then we shuffled all of our options. So now we'd like to know where that correct one ended up. And if we look at the Python list documentation, 
I think no, not there. Python list. the tutorial, not list comprehensions, maybe it's, okay. Not index of, uh, index, okay. So return the index of the list item, uh, of the first list item whose value is x. So what we have here is a list of options. Uh, it's all been shuffled now and we want the index of the correct option. So we want self dot options and we want to find the index of the correct answer. The one that we saved up here before we shuffled it. Okay, so that's easy, right? So we shuffle this list, save the correct answer, shuffle it, and then we look up the correct answer, and, uh, and that's what we save as our correct option. Okay, so uh, now we're back to not knowing the answers to these questions. Anybody want to guess? Three? Correct. Top ten hit for Chubby Checker? One? Three? No, turns out it's one. This one we've seen before, but I don't remember the answer. Roy Jones? Wrong. Steve Collins? Correct. Midnight at the Lost and Found. What kind of cigarettes does James Bond smoke? Woodbine? Wrong, Chesterfield. Everyone knows this one, right? Three? So, so it seems like it works, it randomizes things, and somehow uh, things got a little bit simpler now. All the logic for randomizing the answers and, uh, and storing the correct answer, that's all stored up here in this question object. The thing gets randomized when the question is created, and then after that, the quiz game itself doesn't really have to worry about that so much. It just, uh, it just prints the question and then checks, uh, you know, checks if the answer is correct by looking at the, the correct answer that's stored alongside the, the question. Okay. Um, so normally when you, uh, when you create an object, there's a little more to it maybe than, than this. Uh, you might want to have more than an init function, but in this case, it's, uh, it's enough for us just to, to have init. Um, anything else that could be uh, stored as an object in this game? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the player information or the, the player's progress, all that stuff. So... Let's say, uh, 
I don't know what we want to call it. Uh, let's just say progress. So we'll create a new class called progress and And so what are the things that are part of progress? Or player information? Score. So score starts out at zero, I guess. Lives. That starts out at three. Anything else? Level. So that starts out at, I think it starts out at one. Okay, um, now I'll show you a neat trick, which is, so here we, uh, you know, we define this method that takes no arguments, and it initially sets the score to zero, the lives to three, and the level to one. Uh, if you find yourself doing this, sometimes it actually makes more sense to take a method that takes arguments, but that have default values. Then, later on, if for some reason somebody wants to, uh, wants to create a partial progress, maybe they want to load a save game or something, then they have the option of actually deciding on the number of lives, the number of the score, and, and so on. So, um, so Pythons or functions in Python can take default values you just do them exactly like this. You, you list the parameters and, uh, and say equals whatever the default value is. So back to our game, that means these three lines we can wipe out entirely. OK. <clears throat> Now, uh, now we don't have a variable called level anymore. We have a variable called progress that itself has a, something called level, and it has something called score. Maybe progress wasn't the best name because it seems to capture more than just progress. Um, lives, losing lives doesn't seem to be progress, but there you go. And uh, maybe we could, so, you know, there, there we've basically just relabel those things as progress. Uh, this got simplified, the initialization. Um, but maybe we can leverage this a little bit better and say that actually maybe progress should, uh, should be able to turn itself into a string that we can print. Yeah, so if we, uh, I don't think we did it for this game, but if you want to prompt the user for their name at the beginning, you'd store that in that, that class. You might then also change the name of the class to something like game info or, or something, but um, yeah, you, you can maybe player info. Um, okay, so now rather than print that, we can just print progress. Let's test that out.
control. Lives not defined on line 58. And why is lives not defined? Because it should be progress.lives. So there we go. Um, when we print our progress, that's this line right here. That, oops, that calls the uh, the progress is string method, converts it to a string, and prints this string here. Okay. So by putting things into objects like this, you can, well, you can do a lot of things. You can group together information that's related. So for example, all the information about a particular question should be grouped together this way. Um, as well, you can, uh, so that, that means, for example, that uh, what was three lines of, of code here, we, we put into just a single line. Uh, that's fairly, that's a fairly modest decrease in lines of code, but very often for these kinds of things, you have, uh, you have tons of stuff, you know. If your game is a little more complicated, you might not just have lives, score, and, uh, and, uh, and level, but you might have things like inventory, you might have things like uh, character type, you might have an image of your character, you might have all kinds of, uh, of stuff that you'd like to group together this way. And you don't want to have to, every time a new character, in your code, when you create a new character, to have to rewrite all that instance, all that initialization. So objects are, are good for that. Um, as well as for, for having these, uh, these, these functions that, uh, that turn themselves uh, into strings or, or whatever. I mean, that, that do stuff on the object. So, um, so here, for example, this object actually does some non-trivial stuff in its initialization. It shuffles its, uh, its options. Okay. Um, so, I don't know. Is there any more objects we could tease out of this game? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we didn't, we don't have any notion of time in this game other than a bit of sleeping. But yeah, you could maybe uh, do something with, with time. We'd have to be more, more precise. Um, but at this point, I don't know that, I don't see any obvious candidates left over in, in this game. Um, Right. If you look at the, a good, you know, a good way to tell, for example, is if your main loop has a ton of uh, local variables in it, then maybe those can be grouped together into objects. That's essentially what we uh, what we did with the the, the progress object. And for uh, yeah, for the 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 questions, we took an unstructured array or a structured array and made it into something a bit more bit more meaningful. Um, so I don't know, I think that's probably a good place to, uh, to break today. And now is the best time for you to go and start on your assignment. So you can knock off parts one and two very easily if you go do them right now. <laughs> <laughs>